Hi, everyone. My name is Laura Cutlip. I am a policy advisor with the Western Governors Association. Thanks for joining us today for part three of our webinar series, COVID-19 Economic Impacts and Mitigation under the WGA Chairs Initiative of North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum, Reimagining the Rural West. You can find the recordings of the previous webinars in the series on the initiatives page at WGA's website, westgov.org. Today, we will start by allowing each of our panelists to give opening remarks, followed by a moderated discussion led by WGA Director Troy Timmons, who will then open the Q&A portion up to audience questions. To send in questions, please use the chat function on the left side of the screen and address them either to a specific presenter or you can address them to everyone. Um, you may submit your questions at any time during the webinar and I will pass them to Troy for use during the discussion. Um, thanks everyone again. And uh, first I will turn it over to Jim Augsbury, the Executive Director of WGA, for a few opening remarks. Thanks so much, Laura. Uh, Reimagining the Rural West, the WGA policy priority of our chair, North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum, is really one of the most ambitious WGA chair initiatives in recent memory. Built around the three pillars of opportunity, community, and connectivity, we have over the past year conducted a penetrating examination of issues in economic development, infrastructure, and quality of life. What distinguishes WGA chair initiatives is that they drive to action. If all we did with these projects was assemble experts and identify common issues and profile case studies and synthesize best practices and share information and ideas, that would doubtless be a valuable uh, use of our time. But Western governors are about action, not just talk. So we are mining these workshops and webinars and surveys and other products of this initiative to develop meaningful deliverables for Western governors. The recommendations produced by this initiative will inform gubernatorial policy and WGA work on rural prosperity issues for years to come. In recent weeks, the focus of the initiative has shifted to the enormous effects of COVID-19 on rural communities. Today's webinar is the third to specifically examine COVID-19 economic impacts and mitigation on Main Street. Today's session will highlight challenges facing Main Street businesses and feature the voices and perspectives of business owners, community leaders, and lenders. Small business is the backbone of the American economy, and it helps define the life of rural communities creating jobs, driving growth, and contributing to the vitality of Main Street. The COVID-19 health crisis has put many small businesses at risk as they try to maintain their operations in a crisis environment. Stay-at-home orders and mandated closures and other restrictions are affecting businesses of all stripes, from restaurants and gyms to manufacturers and professional services. Through the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, better known as the CARES Act, Congress has taken action to provide relief to small business. To be sure, there have been major challenges in designing and deploying such a large-scale program in such a short amount of time. Looking ahead, Western governors are committed to working cooperatively and productively with their federal partners to address issues surrounding the delivery of assistance to Main Street. It is in that same spirit of collaborative partnership that we are today engaging small business owners and local lenders to discuss Main Street's needs in the short and midterm. What tools do we need? How can we better communicate and coordinate our efforts? How can we all work together more productively and cooperatively to address the needs of Main Street? Moderating the uh, discussion today is Troy Timmons, WGA's Director of Strategic Initiatives. Uh, Troy has spearheaded WGA's COVID-19 response efforts on behalf of Western Governors, and I am very proud of the work that he continues to perform under extraordinary circumstances. Troy? Uh, thank you, Jim. Um, we, I, you explained everything very well. So, um, we've got a pretty good-sized panel here. We'll get right to it. Um, and uh, appreciate the time that the gentlemen uh, joining us today uh, have given us. And so, I'll, what I'll do is just run through a quick introduction of our panelists, um, and then get right to it. Um, so that we, hopefully we have a good chunk of time for some discussion. Um, Ryan Laws is the president and CEO of the Sport Pro Image Sports franchise and is based in Salt Lake City, Utah. He's been with Pro Image Sports since 1990. The company has over 100 stores throughout the United States uh, with additional locations in Canada and the Dominican Republic. Um, 
David Amen is from Westminster, Colorado, and is the president of Lodging Associates, a hotel and restaurant development company which currently owns and operates uh, award-winning Hampton Inn and Suites, Homewood Suites, and Double Tree Hotel properties. Um, James Martin is the CEO and owner and entrepreneur of several wineries and wine packaging ventures in Oregon. Copa de Vino is a wine by the glass invention he made famous on Shark Tank that is sold and distributed nationally. He's repurposed the Sunshine Mill, which I believe is in Oregon, into a destination winery and tasting room. And he also farms the largest planting of Oregon Pinot Noir east of the Cascades, uh, the Oregon Mountain Vineyard. Uh, Gregory Price is joining us. He's from the Dalles, Oregon, and has more than 20 years of business development experience. He's an entrepreneur, small business owner, and has worked in sales, marketing, policy, and business consulting. He currently serves as the director of the Small Business Development Center at Columbia Gorge Community College in Oregon. And finally, Koger Probst is the president and CEO of a and Bank and the Sturm Financial Group. Koger brings more than 35 years of experience in community banking. He's a Colorado native, lives now in the Denver metro area, and is a past chair of the Colorado Bankers Association. Um, so this is an excellent panel to, to look at the challenges that COVID-19 has presented and, and take a look at the what we did in the course of our first two webinars looking at um, federal and state and local assistance programs that are available at this time of crisis and uh, how businesses can use those effectively, some of the challenges they face, but also some of the solutions that are out there for small business owners. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today and we'll just go in the order on that title slide there. So Ryan, let's start with you. Great, thank you, can you hear me? Yes, sir. You're good. Great. Um, grateful to be included in this discussion. I, um, I'm hoping that I represent our owners and other small Main Street retailers today. So my name is Ryan Laws. I'm the CEO of Pro Image Sports. Pro Image Sports is a mall and Main Street retailer of sports licensed product throughout the United States. And we have locations in 14 of the 17 Western Governor States. Ours are the stores you visit before tailgating with your friends or when you buy your son or daughter a jersey of their favorite player or a hat from their favorite team. We sell apparel, headwear, and novelty from all sports leagues, including the NFL, NBA, MLB, NHL, and the NCAA. Our operators come from a diverse background and very much represent the American dream. We are immigrants from India who started out living in a Main Street gas station and worked hard to achieve their dream of owning and operating several pro-image sports stores. We are a woman who lost her husband to cancer and stepped in to run a seven-store operation. We are owners who are only a couple generations away from their grandparents selling dolls to tourists in Mexico. We are operators who have college and graduate degrees who left the corporate world in order to be their own boss. And we are operators who had to rely on our religious communities at times because no one else would provide funding. What we all have in common is that we work extremely hard. Our entire lives are invested in our stores. We employ others and our cash flow is tight most of the year. I believe that the reason the PPP and other financial programs, the reason they were created is to help, is to help small businesses own, business owners like us. As you might imagine, our stores have been crippled by the coronavirus-related shutdown. Year over year, we are down over 95% in the past two months. And in businesses like ours with limited margins, this revenue could be the difference between realizing our dreams of business ownership, providing for our families, employing members of our communities, and one that is forced to close our doors. As of today, less than 30% of our stores have reopened and we are eager to get back to work when we are allowed to do so. 
My comments today address the implementation of the PPP, the Paychecks Protection Program passed by Congress. 96% of our stores have been funded. As originally written, this bill was thoughtfully crafted and well-designed plan that gave us hope for a successful path forward. However, conditions added to the bill after it was signed have severely limited its ability to help businesses like ours survive through the closure period. Specifically, added requirements that at least 75% of all PPP loans are spent on wages within eight weeks after loan closing. We have store owners who have received funding but are now struggling on how to use it because we haven't been allowed to open. Hiring employees with nothing to do is a terrible use of funds and simply bad for business. Additionally, if owners do not use the money within eight weeks on very specific costs, it turns into a loan. For stores like ours, taking on a loan of this type simply delay delays our inevitable closing. Instead, these same funds could be used for a wide variety of expenses that will help our businesses succeed long term. They include more to more towards rent, store modifications to comply with new safety guidelines, and buying merchandise that is critical for businesses like ours to succeed. Just off script a little bit last night, um, I spent an hour on the phone with two of our owners in California who are stressed, can't sleep. They don't know when they're going to be open. They have employees calling them that depend on them, are not sure what to do with their loans or their PPP funds because, you know, they don't have clear guidance on what they're supposed to do. But their question is the same as probably everybody's on this call. And it basically is, Ryan, like, I'm required to spend money in eight weeks and I'm not even allowed to open yet and don't know when we will be. What should I do? I mean, that's a great question. What should they do? This is an example of a bill that is powerful in its purpose and intent, but severely flawed in its execution. When news of the original bill was released, we were excited about the potential of the funds to help our store owners weather the difficult time. Instead, it has caused confusion, fear, and if used as instructed, will hinder our success instead of help it. Additionally, some of our stores have just reopened, and some won't open for weeks and possibly months, depending on the state. We need more than eight weeks to deploy PPP money the correct way. When we are allowed to open, we will hire back employees and get back to February 15th levels per the original bill language. On behalf of our our store owners and thousands of owners like them across the 17 states, I'm asking that the governors that they use, that the use of funds is relaxed in a way that gives owners greater flexibility to use the funds in ways that will enable our long-term success. Specifically, I ask that you strongly encourage Congress to remove the 7525 rule and extend the eight-week use period to 20 weeks. By doing this, you will place trust in the hands of those who know their businesses better than anyone and who will use it to ensure that their doors remain open and their employees remain employed. We're also asking that a clear and consistent plan be communicated for reopening. We have already had one store that was allowed to open one day, then close the next due to safety concerns of the city. We are also reading that some states want to do a testing period. To a small business owner, the idea of offering people their jobs back and having to turn around and lay them off because the test did not work could be another nail in our coffin. We want to return to work as soon as possible but want reassurance that once our doors are open, they will be allowed to remain open. And I want to close uh, my initial comments just by thanking Congress and the governors for all their efforts in attempting to help small businesses. We need it, and just a few adjustments could help our long-term chances of success. And then also just want to applaud everybody on this call uh, for standing up making their voices heard. I believe there's no doubt that when changes are made, and I think they will be to help, it'll be due to people on this call and many throughout the country who wrote letters, made calls, educated their government representatives, and just kept pushing. So I'm proud to be part of this and um, turn uh, my time back to Troy. Great, thanks, Ryan. Um, Let's go with Mr. Amon.
Troy, David, thank you for the opportunity. And um, I agree with uh, Ryan. We are in the hospitality business, and we are seeing the very same scenarios. But um, I'd like to take uh, this opportunity to um, to uh, shed some light on how and why these challenges uh, facing Main Street business became so difficult, uh, requiring billions in uh, aid to small business. All indicators that we see point to an economy where the current situation will end up as many multiples of 2008. And there are two main reasons that we all need to understand. First, starting in 2002, when we had the SARS outbreak, the insurance companies made a quiet and a strategic move. A small change was made that going forward, business income loss during a pandemic like COVID was no longer covered. If we had been prudent enough to pay attention to that important change, as a society, part of this risk today would have been covered by insurance. The hotel and restaurant community never took this loss of coverage seriously. Uh, A strong economy, robust consumer spending made it difficult uh, for even the brightest of us to look at getting pandemic coverage back. In fact, the insurance companies had identified this risk early, but nobody else could be convinced that this was important. So here we are. No one has insurance coverage for COVID losses, and I'm still very baffled as to what insurance is really for. If there's no help when the need is this severe. Within our government, many high-ranking officials knew the change, yet a very strong lobby muted any response, and no change was made. Second, the economic expansion of the last decade was a phantom leap in our economy. Very low interest rates kept lending strong and brought relative stability that churned out the longest economic expansion of of modern times. The near zero rates on bank deposits also kept most excess capital invested and very little in savings. As 2020 started, what kept me worried was what I saw as excess in our economy the excess that kept prices competitive and inflation low. The flip side of that was razor-thin margins for nearly all service-oriented businesses, and particularly for most retail and restaurants. COVID became the perfect storm with timing that caught most small businesses with little cover. Outside of large companies like Apple and Amazon, there is little liquidity that your neighborhood business has. This lack of liquidity within the small business community makes it difficult to survive this economic pause. And programs like PPP are the lifeline for Middle Road America and nearly all small business. And thus, these programs must be crafted carefully so they achieve the goal of Congress and help Main Street business, particularly in rural communities, who will need much more help than resource-rich metro areas. So I hope when we get done, we can iron out the issues within PPP uh, that can really help us resolve some of the challenges that I face in common with Ryan. Great. Thank you, Mr. Amin. Uh, Let's turn now to James Martin. Hi, this is James. Um, you know, I think that uh, both the prior presenters already presented a lot of the content that I think I was interested in discussing, but I think there's one piece here that uh, is affecting my business uh, significantly. And uh, to give just a little background of, of my company, um, I'm a, a operator of several small businesses. So uh, I think in comparison to the other two presenters, uh, much more of the hands-on operator. And so in the trenches every day and uh, in, within that world of, of uh, the trenches, <clears throat> understanding that the PPP loan, which initially looked as, as some uh, to, to most of us as a, as a very great opportunity because we we're going to build up more debt. We were still, as, as a business, as, as we all know, small businesses don't have deep capital reserves, nor do, do they have the access to it. 
So for my business, the challenge has been um, trying to understand how I have to redevelop my business just so I can get this PPP loan to work. Um, the rules that came post-funding seem to be so much more established around trying to pre prevent and create uh, prevention of fraud. Um, and so within those guidelines, the strictness of it are, are impossible for me to, to try to oper operate my business within that. So these guidelines have established uh, so many rules that all I'm looking at it now as is, is an extension of, of, of debt because having that forgiveness uh, is not going to work. I can't operate my business right now because we, we have been closed. I can't hire my employees back. It's not the first thing that I need to, to fund. I need to fund my business to pivot to exist in the next two years of a, a, a long potential pandemic. So the, the products that I sell right now are more established towards uh, events and venues. Uh, for example, Madison Square Garden, Disney Parks, that's where I sell my products. Those, those places are going to be the last to turn on. So pivoting my company means reestablishing the current assets that I have, which is manufacturing of wine, manufacturing of packaging, reestablishing that to, to uh, a new customer base. That needs to be my focus first before I put positions back in place for a business that no longer exists. And the PP loan is really trying to drive that. How, how should I... Uh, so, so what are, what are really my needs? My needs are uh, the other half of what the the entire stimulus package was supposed to be, which is the EDA loan. The EDA loan allowed me to think long range. Uh, I believe up to ten years on on this type of loan, where I could look at uh, borrowing up to two million or up to a significant amount that I can reinvest and again repurpose the current assets I have right now into a new business activity. And the EDA loan, which is the other half of, of this package, has been dropped down to almost nothing. Um, and I haven't even gotten my first, the, the 10,000 grant that's supposed to come with these, these loans. So, um, and, and you know, I've been waiting for what? Six weeks, seven weeks, no response. Um, what, what, what do I believe? Uh, should happen again. I'm, I'm a much smaller operator, and so I'm just the little guy here. But um, I think that we did get a great deal of activity getting the banks involved um, because we gave a, a face for someone to talk to, um, and they struggled through a hell of a lot of, of uh, problems trying to get the PPP loan rolled out. But um, allow the 7A or the other uh, uh, 504 loans to have different criteria, uh, have them become something where the bank can go ahead and, or, or the bank can process the EDA loans. Um, I realize the EDA loans don't have, there's, there's not enough money. Um, but the 7A a and the 504, I think still can have that kind of funding. I need long-term financing. I don't need a short-term waiving of, of wages. Uh, and I certainly don't want to carry uh, debt for uh, that's on the PPP loan where it's a two year payback. It's a really steep amortization. I need to think long term. I need to be able to pivot, and uh, and so that's 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 my story from here. Great, thanks, sir. Um, let's turn to uh, Gregory Price. Hi, <clears throat> thanks, Troy. Uh, and thanks to the other speakers, I certainly would echo everything they have said. There's no way that we can uh, grant our way out of this, and small businesses certainly can't take on a significant amount of debt to solve their way out of this. And having worked with and advised literally hundreds of small businesses that are in crisis right now, uh, <clears throat> the the, both the PPP and the EIDL have certainly fallen short for a majority of them. Certainly the EIDL loan, uh, initially the intent was that $10,000 grant would go out to all applicants that were eligible. 
And the SBA decided that because of uh, the limited funds that would be uh, restricted to $1,000 per employee. And that's a pretty easy thing for uh, a lot of businesses to qualify for that $10,000 grant. But for a huge amount, especially in our rural areas where you have sole proprietors and self-contractors uh, that <clears throat> don't have employees, that, that puts it at a $1,000 grant. And similar to what James said, they still haven't even seen that. And the rest is debt. And that's just uh, difficult for them to really leverage. And as of yet, they haven't really received it. Um, kind of similar with the PPP. A lot of the issue that I have come across, whether it's dealing with the banks or the small businesses, is lack of clarity, um, uh, the poor timing, and, and especially with the idle loan. Uh, and the lack of guidance from, uh, in particular, the SBA, and then recognizing it's almost an impossible ask. And it's it's certainly not a problem that you can solve with a, the shotgun approach that is really their only tool at the moment. Uh, so it's, it's understandable, but certainly frustrating. <clears throat> One of the things that has really helped us as a region is we have put together an economic resiliency team, and this is a nonpartisan team with uh, folks from Business Oregon, our, our Economic Development Department, the Small Business Development Chamber, our, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, local business leaders, uh, the Department of Environmental Quality, uh, the Governor's Office, uh, you name it. We have a, a really diverse team of stakeholders that are working on this problem from all angles, 24 hours a day. And we've recognized that the federal government is not going to solve this problem for us. And the support is, is, uh, is helpful, but we need to come up with solutions locally. And having a team that really represents a wide range of stakeholders across our community solving these problems has helped us to have a little more of a targeted approach. So we feel like we've been able to do a lot more with a lot less. Um, <clears throat> another really great program is the uh, emergency funds coming through the state that have been, or that will be distributed locally. Uh, again, through some of these same partners that help us get money in the hands of the small businesses, especially those, as I had mentioned, the sole proprietors and uh, uh, self-employed and those that missed out on the PPP and the idle loan uh, to get them some of the uh, the support that, that they really need. And one another thing that I've really been focusing kind of to what James had said is to really be supporting businesses to uh, switch their way of thinking and, and to use his term to pivot. And uh, I really focus on sustaining and incremental innovation and trying to switch the perspective of this challenge to some opportunity and providing them tools and resources and sometimes just the, the confidence that uh, there are new markets. There's other ways to uh, address this this challenge, and that having some uh, pragmatic, aggressive stance in terms of your business, uh, I think, is really beneficial for some of the small businesses that hopefully will will make it through this. Um, so we're trying to remain optimistic despite some of the challenges. And one of the good things that with the round 3.5 of the funding is the appropriation of the 60 billion to the small and mid-sized banks and the community development financial institutions that generally serve those underserved communities, which often are in our rural communities. And that has really helped those funds last a lot longer and allow those other businesses a better chance at accessing them even though they might be difficult to use for all the reasons Ryan, David, and James mentioned, uh, that certainly has helped provide a little more of a target, targeted application for some of those funds. Um, so uh, that's, that's kind of my piece, and we're going to keep working the problem, uh, both from a state, local, and, and federal level as best we can. 
Okay, thanks, Gregory. And let's turn to Coger. Probst. Thank you, Troy, and thanks to the other speakers. And I want to thank the Western Governors for giving us a chance to talk about this important topic. Uh, a little background: A and B Bank is a we're 2.7 billion. We're um, we're in three states: Colorado, Wyoming, and Kansas. We are large enough we can do some interesting things, but truthfully, we're a pimple compared to the giant banks. And we are we're a community bank. We're family and employee owned. More, we are a people and relationship driven organization. And to give a little flavor for that, when the pandemic crisis emerged in late March, we jumped into action. We did not post on a website. We literally, our officers called every single one of our amortizing loans. And that's from the smallest uh, car loan to our mortgage loans, to our uh, business loans, to commercial real estate, and we offered a three-month payment deferral, no questions asked. We had about two-thirds of our um, customers take advantage of that, and some of them took it, they were just banking it. Some of it took it so they could help tenants. Um, but we estimate that this action alone injected $36 million of deferred payments over that three-month time frame into our communities. And our, com and our communities range from metropolitan areas like Denver and Kansas City and Colorado Springs to resort areas like Aspen and Telluride to western slope of Colorado like Grand Junction and Rifle to Cheyenne and, um, and rural areas like Buffalo and Worland, Wyoming. And, and it's impactful in every one of those. When Congress began de debating the CARES Act, we were excited about that. And we believed, like a number of the other speakers, that it was well designed and that it could provide a meaningful chance for small businesses and their employees to survive. And I want to emphasize survive and short, a short shutdown. So we began calling those customers before the act was passed. We personally talked them through what the what the requirements appeared to be based on the act. And then we personally took applications. We did not stand up a website. We walked our customers personally. Every one of 2,400 applications got talked through about what, what did we know, what it looks like, and ultimately we lent out 285 million, just over 100,000 to 2,400 small businesses. So, but as the other speakers have detailed, you know, there were some real flaws when in the rollout, and there's a couple that just hurt my heart, frankly, as a community banker. One of them is that we we do not lend without regard to ability to repay, but as an industry and as as an as A and B bank. We shoveled $285 million out with zero in thought about ability to repay because these loans were designed to be forgiven. And I believe James maybe talked about the two-year need for longer. The truth of it is we are condemning a lot of our small businesses to failure if these loans are not, con um, re they're not forgiven. Because those loans become, then all of a sudden, they come to as a two-year payback at a time when businesses do not have resources to repay it. And what's worse, we as banks, we have a 100% SBA guarantee, which good for us because we'd have never done the loans without it, without any thought for ability to repay. But it traps the small business and the bank because we, will, we can't redo that loan. Because if we do, we give up the guarantee. And David, in one of your earlier comments, and I'm just going to say it for you, um, you had talked about now we take a bunch of really good people, good entrepreneurs, and we brand them forever as delinquents with the SBA and, and eliminate their ability to go out and be successful later on. And, and if that happens, that's a tragedy. So they ask for the for the governors, and we know you don't have decision making, but purportedly the SBA will come out with their final, um, what we've heard this week is they'll come out with hope maybe by early next week with the forgiveness rules. And our ask is please, please, please contact the Treasury, 
contact the SBA and um, make your voices heard because Main Street businesses are, uh, are at stake. The second thing I want to talk about is that our businesses and their employees need your help restarting our economy. And as a banker of nearly 40 years, it's hard to say that, but it's true. Um, and I've, I've had the misfortune or fortune, I guess, to live through and work through the economic malaise of the 1980s, the 20% prime rate, uh, the Russian food embargo, the ag meltdown, the energy and real estate crashes in the 80s, the 1986 tax act, which threw commercial real estate into a spin, the SNL crisis, Resolution Trust Corporation, the dot com era, 9 11, and of course the 2008 Great Recession. And as David said, I agree with him completely. This is shaping up to be worse than all of those. And frankly, I worry that it'll rival the Great Depression. Most states, municipalities, businesses, individuals build contingency plans. So far, though, who's been hit worst are the, are the folks that are at the bottom of the chain, uh, service industry workers who have very little contingency, but no one, no one can plan for this kind of stoppage. Going from 100% to 0% overnight, overnight is not a planable event. And I have to say, and I, other speakers have said this, no government stimulus can replace the wealth creation of a working economy. And no matter how much money we throw at it, it's just a Band-Aid, and it's a Band-Aid on a gap, gaping wound. And our economy is not a zero-sum game. When it's working, wealth is created. But during a stoppage where no one is working, the personal and business wealth drains away. Those resources aren't being transferred to someone else. It's not zero sum. They are simply being lost and they're lost forever. So as these businesses close, there will not be capital lining up to replace these entrepreneurs. And in places like where I grew up in northeastern Colorado, in those rural areas, they're not coming back. Without opening up soon, we are setting up an event to rival the Great Depression. And worse, jokers like us who are my age are dooming our children to many lost years. Millennials have gone through two of the biggest, worst events, two of the three biggest events in, they went through 08 and they're going through this. That generation is in for a rough go if we cannot turn this around quickly. We all know the devastating employee numbers, the layoffs, um, and business after business is on the clock, burning reserves and heading to a restructure or bankruptcy. Supply chain interrup interruptions are rampant, and this is all in a span of two months. But you, as elected officials, and we as citizens have responded admirably. Help me with that. We responded well to flatten the COVID curve, and that was the goal. And I think as a communities, we have done. I mean, I'm, I, I am proud to be an American who has done been part of that. But during that period, AMB Bank, as an essential business, continued to operate. And we kept our banking centers open and we kept our people coming to bank to the bank in order to help our customers work through. Now we modified our workspace, we implemented CDC guidance, and I have to say we've done it well and we've done it safely. And consequently, we have continued to provide that essential service in a safe and effective manner. But we gotta let other businesses have that opportunity. In the states where A and B is operating, in Colorado, Wyoming, and Kansas, I am thankful and encouraged that our governors are on the path to thoughtfully reopening and doing it for the physical, mental, emotional, and, and it's fair to say, the economic health of our states, our municipalities, our people, and our business. And as a banker, if we can keep the economy running and open, I am hopeful that we can then continue to have the resources necessary to strategically battle the new COVID hotspots, which we know will inevitably rise. 
So thank you. Thank you for all you're doing. And Troy, thank you for the opportunity to talk today. And I would turn it back to you. Uh, thanks, Koger. And um, just one reminder, as we start to get into some of the discussion here, um, if you have questions, please uh, go ahead and uh, type those out in the attendee chat function, um, and we'll uh, get those to the panelists. Uh, the, the first thing that I want to hit on, um, and it it's generated by some of what James was talking about, um, and it gets, well, and all of you have spoken about uh, the Paycheck Protection Program, and I'd love to get your thoughts on how that program could be more effectively uh, implemented. This will get into a broader discussion of, of what we need to be doing uh, or what assistance is most helpful to, at this point. But for the Paycheck Protection Program specifically, um, that was designed by Congress to be exactly what it says, a Paycheck Protection Program. Um, not, And it doesn't really get at some of the, the uh, business survivability issues um, that that a lot of you have talked about the needs and very eloquently the needs that are out there for that so but PPP does allow you to to spend some uh, money on non payroll expenditures and so my question for you guys would be what as we look towards SBA um, and, and SBA is not the only one involved here. Department of Treasury is engaged in this as well. But as they plan to come out with that final guidance, what are some of the things that SBA um, and Treasury could be doing in the, with their final guidance that would, that would, A, protect the original intent of that program, which was to do paycheck protection, but also, B, uh, give businesses some additional flexibility um, to keep their businesses going with funding under that program, um, and then C, not punish business owners for having ex accepted that money um, and then discover that they couldn't take advantage of it for one reason or another. Um, and I don't know who wants to start on that. Maybe I'll ask James if if you would have a response to that, um, and then we'll go from there. Yeah, I think uh, I don't run a business to employ people um, as the first priority. I run a business to try to create a profit, to create enough cash flow so I can, uh, so I, I can grow the business. And um, and so if I only have, since I have no income because I we've been shut down, um, then uh, I can't just go ahead and hire people without uh, any business. And and a lot of my employee employees are actually getting paid a great deal more money than they've ever made working for me because the unemployment program was established where uh, they get an additional six hundred dollars a week. So I've got people making four or five thousand dollars a month that were positions uh that were far less than that too so i'm competing with the interest their best what's in their best interest do i bring them back even though we don't have business to establish yet um uh so i, I think my my short answer in what you're saying is i need the other loan i need the idle loan i have to have the, the money that I'm missing for cash flow, I have to have that operating capital to reestablish my business. I have to find a new customer out there for my products because I can't reach the, the customer I had before because those markets aren't there. So, um, so, but I do have a lot of assets. I do have a lot of, of, of what I need. So what I need is I need that other half. I need the long-term loan because I, I don't have cash flow so I can operate. 
at the same time as, as it would be great to have my employees be able to work for me without the additional, uh, w- with this, the PPP loans. I need, I need both halves of this thing. I only have one half right now. And, and with only one half, um, I can't get going immediately too to try to uh, get the PPP loans waived. So we do need an extension. The obvious thing is we need an extension on the PPP loan and we need to have some sort of new defined uh, system that's a partial idle and a partial uh, SBA 7A. That's my my thoughts, what I need. Hey, Troy, this is Coger. Can I jump in on that one? Yeah, absolutely. So one quick comment on idle. Um, and I agree with what James is saying. One of the, for, for all the challenges of PPP, the good thing was that, you know, it wasn't all tried to force. We, ultimately, the banks had to funnel through one spigot, but at least all the customers weren't being pushed into one tight funnel. Idle is all through one funnel. And the last data that we got was that there's same as a 1.8 million backlog of, of small businesses have applied. So figuring out how to open that funnel up is really critical. In the interim though, so those aren't happening quickly. In the interim, if the PPP can be meaningful and uh, be used in a way that allows the business a chance to not just survive for eight weeks, but to survive for the next 10 years, uh, that is what we need to push for. And the, the couple of things that I would uh, advocate, it can be done simply with the pen, eliminate the use of the, uh, the required use and the required forgiveness rule of the 75% on payroll and let the entities at the small business use it on what, as James was talking about, the most pressing need. And that gives them a chance to be a pl- an employer six months from now, not just for the next couple, three or six weeks. The second thing may may take acts of Congress, but to actually extend the the period, I think Ryan mentioned this in his talk of you know to 20 weeks to spend it and the forgiveness date later on. Hopefully that you know there's a way to get that that isn't an act of Congress, but it, that may be what's required. But that would be my reaction: is those two things matter a lot in making it usable and forgivable. To to add to that, I, I couldn't agree more, uh, Koger. I think you nailed it um, because a lot of the, as I had mentioned earlier, a lot of the people applying for that uh, PPP, especially sole proprietors and self-employed, they don't have a payroll. And if they're not working, they have nothing to forgive short of 25% in their utility costs and and rent uh, and all of those, which are going to be pretty minor, especially if if they're not working. Um, So expanding the eligible requirement or the eligible usage of that is really, really going to provide a lot of immediate benefit for uh, all sorts of people who, who are trying to take advantage of it and right now really can't do anything with the money, uh, especially with the eight week period that right now they're not operating. Troy, um, I uh, was uh, aware, made aware of the PPP program a few days before this whole shutdown started. And from my experience, what I can tell you is that the whole forgiveness component is what was glamorized. And everybody I knew thought this was going to become free candy. And I can tell you, I don't know of a single business peer that presented a viable plan, a a repayment plan, before getting the loan. And to get any loan, you first present a business case. And with PPP, there was uh, no such requirement. And now we are eight weeks are coming up and the economy is still mostly shut. There's There's nothing but panic. And nearly all business, all small business is scrambling to figure out the forgiveness. I am concerned that the current rules, a much larger fraction could end up becoming PPP debt. And it would be wise for the SBA to craft rules that first consider economic conditions and business health, and maybe modify the PPP program so that it's no, not only paycheck protection, 
but business stabilization expenses that can qualify for forgiveness. Uh, additional debt is not what we need today on any of our balance sheets. So that's my take on um, the 7525. Let me um, ask a, a somewhat related question, and I think James and Koger, you both, um, or one of the two of you referred to this, that um, given that the EDL processing, loan processing is taking longer, are there, st are there steps that SBA could be taking to streamline what they're doing with EDL loans? Uh, so that they could crank that through on a more on a on a quicker basis than what they are doing, or so that it looks more like what they're done, what they've done with PPP. And I don't think uh, anybody could argue that SBA probably did things they never thought they could possibly do in terms of processing that many the number of. The amount of work they did under PPP. Are there are there things you could do with EDL loans that that would be that would help the processing of of those applications? My my opinion is that that ship has sailed. Um, the besides hiring more people, which the SBA has been uh, doing. But similar to what James said, there's such a it's it's actually difficult to hire people now, which is ironic because of what they're getting on unemployment or just fear of going back to work in general. Um, but, uh, you know, you can't at this point uh, and maybe Cobra, you have a different opinion, uh, redistribute those out to CDFIs or, or local lenders at this point. Um, and so without just continuing to. Uh, increase the processing power internally of SBA, I don't know that there's much more you can do. And, and similar to what David had brought up, they're also not considering their ability to repay those loans at all. You know, those are just based on income in terms of the amount of the loan that you're going to get. And that's about as much as they're considering. Um, so I don't know that there's much else that can be done. This is Koger, I agree. The we're gonna um, we're gonna come back to that in a, in a little bit. I I want to turn to a question that that we got um, from the one of our attendees, and that uh, goes to. Um, Department of Commerce, the Economic Development Administration, is offering revolving loan funds uh, to current RLF lenders that would allow uh, us to make long-term loans with lower interest rates for the first two years, um, possibly even at 0% for, for one year. Do you think there would be demand for uh, th those EDA loans if they have to be adequately collateralized? Troy, this is Koger. Um, I, it depends on what you mean by demand. And so I'll just answer within our customer base. Um, and a couple of the David said this, I think, well, that, I mean, in the, in this time frame, debt is not a solution for a lot of businesses. It, it becomes a solution. I mean, it becomes just another death knell. And especially, you know, as you're looking out, you have to, it, it's all what your view of the world is. And more and more as the, as the shutdowns go longer, the recovery period goes longer which means that for a business to assume that they're going to get back to where they were on their in their their prior model whether it both on revenue or their expense structure is optimistic and so in a lot of cases more debt isn't 
Now there will be businesses that, that it, that's a good tool for, but I, my bias is it's not the for the majority. Um, the other one would be, and and if you look at, for example, energy, uh, where that price is just you know because of the con the demand fell off just fell off the face of the earth. Companies like that, it might be some you know where some sort of a bridge debt and where they see a, a, a true path towards a real recovery in prices where they are from today, that could be a path. But my bias is it's not a, it, it, it's helpful for some, but not a widespread product. Yeah, I think most of the companies that would be able to take advantage of that, whether it's because they can collateralize it or have the income that they can service that debt, probably aren't in the position where they really need it. And certainly companies that have taken the PPP or the idle and now have more debt to serve, especially if there's uncertainty around the forgiveness, they're going to probably have a harder time qualifying for those funds. And so I I think, in, especially in our community, uh, I don't see that really being much of a solution for, for very many people and could potentially, as a lot of the speakers were saying, get them into more trouble. Uh, on that, I think I think James had the most succinct uh, explanation of why business exists that I've ever heard, um, and it it is there to make a profit, and you don't hire people unless you that money is there to generate salaries and the rest, um, and and then feed back into the business. And if business owners don't see a path forward in terms of ability to get things rolling again, um, the ability to transition to new markets or, or new marketing, um, then it, that is a necessary component of, of even the ability to, to look at taking, new, taking on new debt is the promise or the, the hope that you will see profits generated to be able to pay off that debt. Um, so, what current, I guess my question is, what current mechanisms are out there, either federal, state, or state, or and perhaps there's a local government doing this as well, that that are best suited to allowing a business owner to uh, to do exactly that, have hope that they're going to be able to get their businesses back running and, and profitable, um, but give them the cushion they need to get to that point. James, you've mentioned the EDA loans. Um, are there other places out there that 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 perhaps offer a, a more optimal type of approach? Um, if if you're out there looking for capital right now, I think honestly, Troy, this is where the governors can have the greatest impact in their reopening plan, um, because as we had been talking about. Uh, we can't solve this with with grants and with debt. We need income, and we can't have income without reopening. And that in, is being led by the states and, and by the governors. And having that solid plan in place, in my mind, is is the next step forward and the best thing we can do for small businesses. Troy David. Yes, sir. Um, I'll give you an example of the state aid that I have seen. Uh, in Montana, we did a did a ten thousand uh, dollar grant towards uh, what they call uh, business stability. And to give you an idea, it would take a subway store ten thousand to keep it open for a week. So, like Koger said, we need a working economy. Um, these grants are needed oxygen. 
but I would much rather prefer that state and local leaders uh, focus on stabilizing their own revenues and cover services that citizens and businesses need to function properly. Uh, an example, here in Denver, our mayor offered $4 million towards uh, grants. While they're facing a $200 million shortfall, and dozens of city employees got furlough notices. A state of Colorado is looking at a $4 billion hole. In all honesty, states cannot borrow with the same ease as our federal government. And for that reason, economic aid should be best left to federal levels. This is a serious responsibility. Uh, I think the SBA is best suited for this, and they really need to step up. Okay, so if I'm looking at, um, and I agree with you, the state uh, revenues, uh, almost every state has to balance their budget. And the uh, given the effect of COVID-19 on, on state resources, both from additional expenditures from, from PPE, uh, lost tax revenues, um, especially in states that depend on sales tax, um, it's going to have a dramatic effect on state budgets. And, and so the availability of, of new state money for a lot of this stuff probably I don't think we can count on. If you're looking at, but let's go back to, to what states can do to help uh, Besides just reopening, because it's not just a question of, of reopening, because you've also got to uh, assess for um, hot spots, outbreaks in communities, the possibility that this would that uh, this COVID numbers will start spiking again um, at a local level, at a state level, and even nationally. Um, what are Besides just having a cogent uh, um, reopening plan, what are some other steps states could take to, to allay business fears that um, once they open, they're just going to shut down again? This gets back to some of what I think it was James was saying about testing periods um, and I, so if you were let, let's just put you in the in the shoes of a governor and and if you were writing uh reopening plans to account for the possibility of spikes um and wanting to to give businesses uh, a clear path forward what does that look like um from your standpoint one two is there are there states out there that that are that are doing this really well that um, that we could take those lessons learned and, and apply them to other states. Troy, this, this is, this is Robert, Ron. If I, Go ahead, Koger. Thank you. Um, and just um, so our this afternoon, I'm on a call with um, a group here in the state of Colorado trying to figure out how to use a fund. We've been contacted by the state of Wyoming uh, on how to use a fund to support business, another one in northern Colorado. So there's there's a lot of, of thought about trying to create additional dollars. And um, the I, I agree with just almost everyone who has spoken that there's very little that the you know those there's if more loans aren't the answer, getting open and getting revenue is. And to me. Uh, for and I don't. I'll be curious what others say, but I would so much rather that the those those dollars be used to mitigate the inevitable hot spots that are going to come up because this isn't going away in the short run. And the question is, how bad do we ruin all of the other aspects of of people's lives and livelihoods and other illnesses and things? And so if if that money could be used where it's strategically targeted to addressing where the hotspots come in and provide true meaningful support and and re you know work through those 
while allowing businesses to reopen thoughtfully and start revenue going, that's I'm all in on that. Troy, this is Ryan. Um, in my initial comments, I'm the one that brought up uh, states that are testing. Um, oh yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no, no. That's that's fine. I just I wanted to emphasize, or at least we also talked about states reopening. I think from a small business perspective, and what each one of our guys that has a store or two, what they're looking for is is consistency, um, and just the idea that a state could open and, and test it and then close again, the impact that that has on small business. So some, some things that we need sometimes things to be simple for us to understand, and that is if a state's going to reopen, that they've, they've thought through that, and if there's the chance that in two weeks they may close again, it's, it's better for small business, I believe, not to reopen. So we need a plan. We need to know that we can rely on that plan. Um, and the other thing I wa wanted to go back to just a little bit was the PPP funds and um, agree with COGRA 100%. Small business, what we need is we need to extend the eight weeks and we need to remove the 7525. And that allows us to make good decisions with the money we have and allow us to be open you know, in six months from now, in a year from now, in five years from now, rather than just making sure that that money is spent in an eight-week period. So th those are complicated, but at least to us, very simple. Let us know when we can be open. We'll do it the right way. We can stay open and then change those two things on the PPP. Uh, those are the things we're looking for. One of the things we're doing in our community to try to add that confidence that you were talking about, Troy, and, and this is just a small piece of a huge puzzle, obviously, is really focus on bolstering our uh, medical community, our PPE, uh, pivoting to, again, use James' words, a lot of uh, different businesses in our community manufacturing. So we're trying to create some activity there and get people back to work, generate some income while creating product that really has value and supports the whole community and provides a little more uh, assurity, safety, uh, bandwidth for our hospitals and our medical community to be able to reopen. And just like Koger said, we're going to have more incidents. We're going to have hotspots. And so put some of our economy to work in supporting that before it happens. And that way we can kind of benefit from that activity while supporting the infrastructure that is greatly lacking at the moment. Troy, my opinion specifically to Colorado here is that we have learned to live with almost every other virus, bacteria, infection, except this one. And I am all for uh, mitigating uh, the spread, so on and so forth. But the approach that we've taken, uh, close everybody, has created what I call an economic nightmare for most people. And what we need is we need Colorado open for business. What we need is, you know, safety guidelines. Hey, do this, do that, and uh, stay safe. We don't need to spread this message of fear on a daily basis that scared my family from going out anywhere. And it doesn't help. I think a process going forward where we are open, fully open, each business owner is given guidance that we take from the CDC. Hey, follow these guidelines and operate under this scenario. We will have to learn how to live with COVID. We can't just sit back and say, we're going to stay buckled in and nobody go anywhere. That's not going to be the long-term answer, is my position. I would add something to that. What I've seen, uh, we've got an opening happening here in Oregon at a, a fairly small level, but what, we, what I'm seeing immediately is uh, – the lack of knowledge of we, we all knew what we were supposed to do and we were staying at home. 
that the other half of this is is that opening up is it's a team game it takes the customers and and the general public to act properly do the correct things um what what the states did really well was i uh, teach everyone exactly what they needed to do to stay home and and create enough fear for people to to not want to be out um now what they have to do is, is the harder the next step and the next step is is teaching people how to be good customers how to be a participant in in being uh creating a safe environment out there that makes customers feel comfortable going out and shopping because they're protected otherwise you can you can be open customers are still going to go i don't think i want to take that risk and that's the one piece that we can only influence by creating a really strong educated environment i mean i saw a ton of commercials in this uh, during this uh, from the state uh, telling everyone to stay home thanking them for staying home thanking them for doing their part now we need to ask them and thank them for doing their part by going out but going out in a smart way you can go out you don't have to get sick and you don't have to make others sick and it's as simple as doing these things that's the most important thing the state should be focusing on um on a personal level i had an osha inspector come by here catch one of my guys fixing a roof and and spend half an hour in all of our faces three feet away without a mask on this is a state employee and i'm thinking is this where my this is where my state's focus is they need to repurpose just as i'm doing with my business a lot of people to getting the unemployment paid out there to people the education what people need to do the state needs to focus on what they they do well uh, and, and what they're they're designed for. I agree with everyone when we're talking about money needs to come from the feds for these things. It doesn't come from the states. So they're not going to be good at it. And we already have the instruments in place, but these instruments have to get repurposed and they have to happen fast. Just as I'm trying to do with my business, the governors have to step up very quickly and say, okay, now it's time to lead our people out into this, this new world and give them confidence in that new world. And when those businesses aren't doing the things they're supposed to be doing, slap their hands first before you shut them down next. Um, and have, uh, you know, have that kind of, of uh, again, it's a, it's a team effort to reopen. And it takes, it's going to take everyone to do it. I love your point on, uh, helping people understand what the next steps are and and how they should uh, how, how they should approach that and you're right there were plenty of PSAs information on what to do when we were staying at home and uh, but not so much in terms of how you how we start things back up again that's a really really excellent point um, and I, it, it's a related issue, but let me ask you guys this as well. Um, we know that uh, there's requirements for um, investments in PPE and uh, cleaning supplies that, and, and new practices uh, in terms of frequency of cleaning and, and all of that for both employees at businesses and customers um, how has that gone both in terms of of implementation of it um, and availability of PPE and and that kind of that aspect of this and um, that too is a, is a place where probably some uh, just better public uh, announcements and, and information would be really helpful. Um, but any of you guys' concerns, comments uh, about how how that looks as you start to come back online? Well, I know uh, certainly a lot of concerns from a lot of the all of the small businesses I've worked for or worked with. And uh, 
the guidelines uh, that have been issued by the state are are fairly clear, but have been not disseminated uh, probably in the best way. And we've been trying to put training programs on around that to support the business community and knowing what they need to know. But it's going to be very difficult for small businesses that have to open on a limited capacity at uh, a significantly raised cost of goods sold. If they have to supply PPE for themselves, for potentially their clients, depending on their business, their employees, uh, that gets really expensive really quickly. Um, And especially if it's on a reoccurring basis and the supplies to getting those are bottlenecked as we all know. So that's gonna be the next big challenge for a lot of small businesses to try to stay open. Troy, um, I'll give you a couple examples here. Um, first, the, no business is designed to be profitable at 50% capacity, be it your neighborhood bar or even Amazon. And the guidance that we get from the state uh, changes all the time. Um, and you know, in our field, we need, for us to operate smoothly, we need a clear path forward. And this additional cost of this protective measures to conduct the same activity is just going to add to our business overhead. Uh, one example of this overhead in my industry, specifically in the hotels, is our clean stay program, where we're going to be looking at buying um, these electrostatic sprayers. I mean, I have never seen one, what this is, what this is going to look like. UV lights, uh, we're looking at putting wipes in all public areas, uh, we're looking at um, cleaning light switches and door handles and things that we would normally not do in our ongoing operations. And this is going to add cost while the room rate is reduced, and while there is little business. And federal grants are tiny. The PPP covered 25 days of operations. So to survive, businesses will have to get creative. And that's my opinion, is that you're going to need a strong balance sheet. You're going to need um, a, uh, a strong uh, workforce that can execute uh, all the requirements of the state. And then at the end of all that, we need a functioning economy. argument there and I, my my sense is that if if anybody if any nation can figure this out it's us um, and uh, the history of innovation and as you said creativity that we've exhibited uh, throughout American history I I don't think there's any nation that's better positioned to a, to to meet a crisis like this head on, than than the United States, and come out of it than the United States. Um, so part of that is also just uh, identifying what what those needs are, and then just unleashing people to go tackle them. Um, and again, if anybody can do it, I think we can. Um, but it will be, like you said, it, it is going to be a challenge. And, and part of the problem here is it's been 100 years since uh, we had a, a similar episode to this um, with the flu outbreak of 1918-19. Of um, and so all that institutional memory of, of what, how people responded, what worked and what didn't what has, is long gone. Um, so for all of us, this is this is something on this scale is a, a case of first impression, and which is part of the reason you're seeing, I think, um, requirements changing and and uh, some unstable footing because people j- we just haven't dealt with something like this. Um, but again, I think if anybody can figure out how to how to make it work, it's uh, American workers. Um, 
We've got about 10 minutes left. Uh, and what I'd ask is that I, I want to give each of you an opportunity just to, because we probably, we've only scratched the surface of the things we could talk about today, but, but we have a pretty limited amount of time here. I'd, I'd want to take, give each of you a chance just to uh, mention something that we didn't cover here that we should have, um, or, and, and hopefully that provides us uh, us here at WGA an opportunity to, to dive deeper into something that, that we sh again, we should have covered here, but, but maybe didn't. Um, and any other uh, parting comments before we let everybody go for the day? So we'll, we'll go in order of uh, the original panelists. And so, Ryan, I would start with you just for a couple of, a couple of minutes of, of Parting comments. Sure. I'm not sure I know uh, something that we didn't cover, uh, but I think a summary for me is that I, I think if every small business could be on this call right now and, um, and Main Street retailers, they would love this type of call because what I hope all of our elected officials understand is that these are the conversations that are happening all day, every day is surviving, what can we do? We need a clear path forward. We need um, whatever guidelines we have, they need to be clear, they need to be consistent. And then just our frustration as business owners when we read these guidelines on forgiveness or timelines, just the frustration of, it almost seems as who's making these, that we need somebody in business to be making decisions because they don't make sense. But it is, um, we're ready, we're ready to work hard, we're ready to come out of this, we want to be, we're ready to pivot, as James said, um, but we need help in um, just mostly guidance and just common sense solutions. So uh, I want to say thanks. I've learned from all the presenters today and happy to be part of this. So thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Um, David. Troy, um, so uh, I would like to say that, you know, we're going through something of a pretty serious nature, healthcare-wise, business-wise, and some things need to be done. And what I've seen is that our fiscal programs must not have the drag of political agendas. Our state opening uh, programs and our state guidance should not have the drag of political agendas. Policy must be market-based, is my opinion. And... I honestly believe that SBA needs a reboot and they really need to rethink their mission on what was that program established for. Have they diverged too far from connecting with rural America and mainstream business? And finally, history has taught us humans, when left alone, find a balance very quickly. Our collective judgment erases these severe ups and downs. And if at the end of the day, if we want to keep these jobs alive, and keeping the businesses themselves alive for the long term, then we must leave it to the, our collective judgment. Thank you, Troy. Good. Um, James, to you. Um, I love the idea that America is great, and if anyone can figure it out, it can be us. And at the same time, I think that that same kind of thought pattern is what's driving oftentimes um, the uh, residual effect that we're uh, almost arrogant that uh, because we're, we have this kind of confidence in ourselves, it means that I don't have to um, take some of the steps. I mean, if I ran a business that way and just thought, well, I'm so great, I don't have to uh, uh, constantly question what I'm doing. None of us as, as business owners, would, would we all know that that's, that's the death to you always. Um, I think Andy Grove, the, the head of Intel, always said, uh, he wrote a book, I think it was called Always Be Paranoid or something like that. Um, we, we right now uh, can't just rest on the laurels of our successes in the past. If you look at us against the rest of the world right now and you were keeping score, we have a very, very big problem comparatively to a lot of countries. Um, what are we not doing that they're doing better? And I think that what you 
definitely can say is those other countries are pulling closer together as a team and pulling all in the right direction. They're also, I have friends in New Zealand and, and they're sharing things with me. And I'm also seeing some of the success that I'm having here and, and what we are doing and reimagining our, our business. And, and what that is, is changing the rules very, very quickly. Um, we're all talking about this PPP program. We need to change those rules right now. Every day, the clock's ticking on us. Am I really trying to bring these people back and try to get them to work? What we need to change the rules fast. We can't sit there and wait and wait and wait. Changing the rules quickly because the rules don't apply to the new world. Um, I've got all these people on unemployment. They're getting paid more money, a lot of them than they ever made before. Give them back to me right now. They're sitting at home. We're reopening. I have a safe environment for them to work. Send them down here. Keep paying them the unemployment. Great. Give me those people to get back down here and help me rebuild a business for them to come back to. Right now, they're just sitting there doing what? Watching Netflix. Change the rules. Um, I'm seeing that with some of the products that I'm launching right now. The, the, the rules were loosened up by the state about take-home alcohol. I couldn't deliver to people before. I couldn't have them... Uh, pick up containers that didn't have a certain fill volume percentage that went back to uh, prohibition rules that make no sense, but those rules were around. All those rules got changed. Now I've got this take-home business that's doing pretty good. I've got, uh, I'm, I'm doing drive-in movies here. I'm doing tastings that I'm shipping all over the country in glasses that I couldn't do before because the rules didn't allow it. But right now, everyone's loosened up the rules. We need to, we need to change quickly and that means we've got what government needs to do right now is loosen the rules really really quickly and adapt and not fall back on what they always fall back on which is well we have these rules we went through a large you know years and years of making rules this way we don't need those rules right now we need to operate like uh like a, a, a country that we say we are that we're adapting and we're fighting this war and we're, we're, we're we're meeting it head on. And that allows us all to pull together. I hear what you're saying, James. And uh, yeah, I've always, America's not great because Americans are great. America's awesome, an awesome place because uh, we have the freedom to, to go get things done and work hard to make it happen. And I think part of the frustration right now is uh, a, lot of, a lot of folks don't even have the opportunity to work hard right now. Um, and that's part of the frustration there. Um, Gregory. Uh, thanks, Troy. I think to your first question, uh, some things that could be focused on or discussed further on down the road is uh, I'd like to see another discussion about regional and local solutions. I know that we've talked a lot about the failings of PPP and IDLE and uh, we've been working really hard as a team uh, across the uh, the Columbia Gorge and beyond and as a state to come up with solutions that are targeted, that uh, can be implemented quickly and are effective. And I think there's a great opportunity to learn from other communities, from other states, and I'd like to see more of that sharing. Um, I like what David said is, you know, leave your partisanship at the door. We've got a lot of work to do, and it's time to lace up your boots and get back to it. Thanks, Koger. Bring us home. So the, I would go back to as these other fundings come in that from the federal government to states for uses, and I, I have to admit I have no clue whether what strings come with those, but rather than creating additional kind of me too or follow on programs that just copy what's already being done, um, I would much rather, and a couple of the presenters said that, you know, keep the states and the counties and the municipalities healthy. The other thing is that, you know, just I think one of the things that's going to hit is you know, starting next year, unemployment rate, I think the estimate in Colorado, it's 800 per employee is going to be the cost. And so if some of those funds could be 
directed as grants to help instead of the um, for just a follow-on loan program as something to help uh, businesses do their part in re-establishing uh, the unemployment fund or things like that. But uh, don't let those dollars burn a hole in your pocket. Really figure out what's a good use of it and a meaningful use that will, again, allow businesses and our communities and economies to succeed in the long term. And I would echo, thank you so much for the opportunity today. Um, this has been a really interesting discussion. Um, and again, I want to thank all five of you for taking the time to join us today, um, because I know you've got plenty of other things to worry about, but this has been really helpful. Um, and every one of you had, had really good insights. Um, so again, really appreciate you taking the time here today. Um, we're going to end because we're at 1230. Uh, um, if you would like a, an encore presentation of this, um, we should have this webinar up on the WGA uh, YouTube site um, so that uh, if folks, if friends of yours weren't able to uh, listen in today, uh, they can they can catch up on the YouTube page. Um, again, thank you, gentlemen, for joining us today. Um, really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, for those of you that attended, um, we really appreciate you taking the time to uh, listen to these guys today. Um, and with that, we'll let you go. Thanks again, folks. Appreciate it. Thank you.